All right, now that we've done the hard work of deriving all of our Fitzunagumo equations and their slight variations, let's go ahead and explore some solutions. And now all of the solutions we're going to explore, we're going to do so numerically through the use of simulation in MATLAB. But I want to emphasize that we could also start applying some of those tools that we knew or developed along the way, those analytical tools like finding equilibria, computing stability, computing null clines, and doing some phase plane analysis through null clines, just like we've done before in class. However, we're just going to explore solutions and basically ask ourselves, what do we get from our equations that we derived? So let's start checking them out. So we're going to just go through all of the equations we have one by one, and we're going to start off with our original Fitzunagumo equations, which are listed all down below here. So these were equations that didn't have any applied current on them. They had no spatial dependence. These were the regular old Fitzunagumo. And we're going to start off with certain values of the parameters, A equals 0.25, our initial population for that blocking mechanism, or initial blocking mechanism strength is zero, and epsilon is 0 0.005. What that tells us is we're gonna then go and look to vary our gamma value on that blocking strength kind of decrease in strength um, for as W increases. So we're gonna change that blocking strength kind of proportionality constant. So we're going to explore these solutions, and I just want to give off some spoilers right as we begin. We're going to see the following. Neurons can only fire once in this model, or not at all. We're going to see that if a, a, a neuron fires, it depends on its initial voltage or its initial potential. We're also going to see, interestingly, that in this model, although neurons might only fire once, they might be in a state of constant firing. So let's check out some solutions. And the first thing we're gonna do is vary our initial potential. And in this model, the way I have this set up is so we can give this an initial potential and then different gamma values. So let's try, let's try an initial potential that's actually less than A in terms of our initial potential is then less than that threshold, so we would expect the neuron not to fire. So let's try something like 0.2, and let's just try a gamma value of say, I don't know, five. All right. Now let's take a look at our solutions. Well, these solutions, what they look like, we have the voltage potential in blue, the blocking mechanism strength in red. Let's just zoom in a bit here. If it's gonna let me and check this out. It might not let me right now. Oops, MATLAB's freaking out. Let's just rerun this again. MATLAB and Zoom apparently don't get along well. But what we see from this initial plot is that we expected this uh, neuron not to fire because the initial value of voltage was less than that voltage uh, threshold A. So the neuron basically just um, decreases in voltage over time, and then every, everything basically settles out to its desired resting potential, which in this case was V tilde equals zero. So this neuron's doing exactly what we expect. It's not firing. The initial voltage potential is less than that threshold. Let's bump up that threshold value though. So the threshold value is 0.25, so let's try something like 0.3 and keeping gamma the same. And in this case, lo and behold, we see that our neuron goes ahead and fires. The initial uh, potential again is greater than that threshold potential. So we expect the neuron to fire. However, it doesn't continue increasing forever, it starts to decrease once that blocking strength gets strong enough. And we see that nice voltage potential signature where we see it overpass or overshoot the resting potential and then eventually kind of go back to where it wants to be. So we see exactly what we're hoping we would see from our model in this case. That neuron fired, we have a beautiful action potential signature, except 
it is only uh, firing once in this case. Well, let's go ahead and just change the gamma value now that we have a neuron that's firing. So let's try now a gamma value of, instead of five, let's try a gamma value of, let's say something like one. What does our neuron do? Well, in this case, the neuron still fires. Our original or initial voltage potential is greater than that threshold. It fires, but if you notice, it actually takes a little longer to recover. Basically, what we saw in that gamma value down below on the right-hand side was that gamma value, since that value is lower, that blocking mechanism is not dissipating as quickly. So we don't expect the voltage to recover towards its resting potential as quickly in this case. All right, so let's do the opposite. Instead of decreasing gamma, let's try a, a value greater than what we tried before, which was five. Let's go to a value of say 10. And lo and behold, in this case, we see a neuron fires, the initial voltage potential is greater than that threshold, but the voltage never actually dissipates. It just stays in that state of constant firing. That voltage is just very, very high. So this neuron is just repeatedly firing in this case. So the blocking mechanism can act, never get actually strong enough to knock down that potential where it needs to be. So these are possible solutions from our original Fitsunugumo equations. Again, we saw these notable features just now by playing with some of those parameters, whether the initial block with the initial potential, um, if it's higher or lower than that voltage potential or the voltage threshold that we set, or what that blocking mechanism signal strength is in gamma. If it's greater or if it's larger or smaller, it will take, um, it will basically uh, tell us what type of action potential event we will recover. So let's check out some of the other variations on Fitsunagumo now. And that would lead us to the second case with this applied current. So again, these are going to be the same equations, but with the addition now of that plus applied current term. And in this case, we're going to use the same exact parameter values, except we're always going to assume that the neuron is going to fire in this case, because we're going to start off with an initial potential greater than the threshold. We're also going to use just a constant current being applied. So our constant current is just equal to 0 0.075. So we're just constantly hitting this neuron with a constant current. And we're going to go ahead and vary the same thing we did before. We're going to vary that gamma value. Let's check out what type of solutions we expect. And some notable features to give away the whole story is we're going to see that the neuron's able to fire once or repeatedly in this case. Again, we're setting that initial potential greater than threshold voltage, so we know that the neuron should fire. Except we're going to see it might only fire once or it could fire repeatedly in this case. We're also going to see, again, that the neuron could get stuck in a state of constant firing, even though we're applying this constant current to this neuron. The other interesting aspect, though, is if we see this neuron fire repeatedly, as in produce periodic bursts in the output, it's actually quite interesting because this constant current that we're applying is enough to basically let that neuron take that constant current and translate that into periodic bursts in output which is quite fascinating because we're taking, again, the same Fitsunugomo equations, except just adding a constant term at the end of the voltage equation. So let's check out some of these solutions now. And again, we're just going to vary gamma in this case. So let's try some values of gamma that are lower and then kind of keep growing larger and larger. Let's try a value, say, gamma equals 1.0. And well, in this case, we knew that the neuron should fire because again, we set that initial voltage potential to be greater than that threshold voltage, except gamma is low enough that it's basically this voltage is firing once and then it's never actually firing again, even though we're applying that constant current to it. So what this really means if we look at this value of gamma is gamma is low enough 
that this blocking mechanism can just repeatedly get strong enough to knock down that voltage. So even though we're applying a constant current, that constant current in this case isn't enough to make that neuron fire again based on this value of gamma or how strong or how, um, how fast this blocking mechanism is dissipating its strength over time because it's dissipating it slower for the slower value of gamma. All right, well, let's try another value. Let's try something like, um, I don't know, 2.5. And well, in this case, increasing that value of gamma, we're seeing a periodic burst in the output now. Our neuron is firing over and over in this case. And now let's think about that for a second. We are applying a constant current to this neuron and this neuron is translating that constant signal into periodic bursts in output, which is something really cool and something, a signature we actually see of real neurons. So this model is actually doing quite a good job describing this action potential dynamics. Now, why would increasing that value of gamma lead to more periodic bursts in behavior? Well, again, when we think about what gamma represents here in this model, increasing that gamma value will basically increase the rate at which the blocking strength decreases over time. So this blocking strength is dissipating a lot faster, which allows this voltage to basically just recover and recover enough that it can actually keep firing due to that constant current being applied. All right, let's check out another solution. This time, let's increase till five. All right, what happened in this case? Well, again, we knew that this neuron would fire because the initial potential is greater than that threshold potential that we set earlier, except in this case, that gamma value is so large that, remember, it's knocking down that blocking strength over time. Larger gamma means the faster rate in which W loses its strength. So as W decreases very, very quickly, it can never get strong enough to effectively knock down that voltage after it fires just once. So even though we're applying this constant current to this neuron, we don't see any periodic bursts in output. We're just seeing a constant kind of firing of this neuron over and over. This blocking strength can never get strong enough to actually knock it down. All right, I hope that this was illuminating of what adding a constant current can do. Of course, the most interesting case perhaps is this case where this constant current is translated into this periodic burst in output. But again, we can move on and look at other variations of this model too. And I also just want to emphasize with these two versions that we looked at, the original Fitsunogumo or the Fitsunogumo with the supplied current, we could do a lot of that same equilibria and stability analysis that we've done to dynamical systems and differential equation models before. And there's a beautiful story in terms of all that analytical work. But again, I just want to give us a flavor of what solutions we expect from these types of models. But let's move on now to the main event, the Fitsunugumo equations with spatial dependence and an applied current. So this is taking us from ordinary differential equations into the world of partial differential equations. Because our Fitsunugumo equations now have both time dependence and spatial dependence. So more than one variable dependence, which takes us into the world of partial differential equations. And in this particular model, again, these are our two governing equations here. We're using those partial derivative signs now because we have things changing both in time and space. And the, and the term that we're going to essentially modify or test different cases for is this diffusion coefficient, capital D. And this diffusion coefficient, again, from what we learned with random walks and diffusion is governing how fast something spreads out from an initial source. So what we expect in this model to do is we have an initial kind of action potential happen at one location and we're wondering how fast that voltage is spreading out to maybe neighboring cells or things around it. 
And for this model, we're going to use the following parameters up above. And we're going to vary again, like I said, the diffusion coefficient. Interestingly, in this model, we are using an initial value of the potential that is less than that threshold value, but we're going to see actually that this applied current value is able to recover this value um, to get this thing to fire. So let's check out some solutions. And the notable things that we're going to see are, we have traveling wave solutions. And for some of you who have maybe taken a PDE's course or are taking one now, this is particularly interesting because this is a diffusion equation or something that's related to a heat equation, yet we're seeing traveling wave solutions even though this, strictly speaking, is not a wave equation. The other thing we're going to see is the dynamics of these traveling waves will depend on that diffusion coefficient. Of course, we could vary all these other parameters. I'm just choosing to uh, vary this diffusion coefficient D to show us the effect of what will happen in terms of different waves spreading out. The other thing we're seeing in a big note is this is telling us potentials can propagate out from their initial source. Let's check out some solutions. So, in our model, again, we're going to vary the diffusion coefficient. So let's start off at a very small kind of modest value and see what happens. So a diffusion coefficient of 0.1 leads us to the following dynamics. Well, we have that initial action potential happening around zero. What's actually happening? Well, it looks like the neuron might be firing if we if it uh, keeps going here. There it goes, it fires, but it actually doesn't spread out. The diffusion coefficient is too small in this case that we're not actually seeing any traveling waves. We're getting this kind of one spatial location that's getting hit with a lot of voltage, but that signature is not, or that voltage is not then spreading out to anywhere else around this neuron. All right, so let's bump up this value of D and see what happens. Instead of 0.1, let's try a value of say, um, let's go to a value of one. In this case, we see that initial action potential event is enough to lead to two distinct kind of spikes that are spreading out in both directions from that initial source of that action potential. And we're seeing more and more of these spikes happen and spread out as we get over time. And these spikes are very, very narrow kind of in their electro potential or their potential values as they're spreading out. So let's keep changing this value a D. Oops. Let's go to a value of D equaling 10. Well, in this case, we're seeing kind of these, a similar thing. We're seeing kind of at potentials spike and then spread out. However, this time these spikes seem to be happening at a longer time away from the one that preceded it. As in these spreading events are happening maybe perhaps a lot faster or happening um, a lot further away in time from the ones that uh, started before it. We're also seeing that these action potential signatures are not as narrow as in the other case because we are seeing those action potentials diffusing over time. So they're both diffusing outward, but the actual width of these potentials are also increasing slightly over time. All right, finally, let's bump up that value even further to a value of the diffusion coefficient being 100. And let's check out the solutions in this case. Well, in this case, we're seeing the same type of thing. We're seeing now what looks like an action potential spike that's happening, these action potentials spreading outwards, 
except we're seeing longer periods of time between successive spreading events. And you can kind of see after these things spread out that the action potential mirrors the uh, value of x equals zero is going back and resetting. And then once it resets, it just, we see a quick spike in the dynamics and then we start seeing the spread of that voltage as it propagates in space. All right, so hopefully this gives you, uh, gives you an idea of some of these traveling wave solutions that are possible from our Fitz and Ugumo equations that have both spatial dependence as well as an applied current acting on them. And there are all these different variations of just these one kind of set of equations, Fitz and Ugumo, that describes the voltage dynamics and blocking mechanism dynamics for action potentials of a single neuron or single cell. Now the math world gets into a lot, lot deeper dynamics governing neuromechanics and a lot of this neurobiology and there's some beautiful stories associated with this. But I hope this was a nice introduction to this general field where some of these very, very popular equations come from as well as some of the solutions that can arise from these typical governing equations of Fitzunagumo.